Good evening. We will go ahead and get started here in just a few moments. As a point of logistics, because of the nature of tonight's talk and the use of the screen, um, it seemed prudential to uh, remove the Blessed Sacrament from the church for this evening talk since the screen is obstructing the tabernacle in many places uh, where you're seated. So the Blessed Sacrament has been removed to uh, the side sacristy, and our Lord will return uh, this evening after the talk has concluded to the tabernacle. In the interim, the uh, proper form of reverence is simply to bow then uh, to the altar uh, when departing the church. So let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Words from Psalm 1. Blessed the man who follows not the counsel of the wicked, nor walks in the way of sinners, nor sits in the company of the insolent, but delights in the law of the Lord, and meditates on his law day and night. He is like a tree planted near running water that yields its fruit in due season, and whose leaves never fade. Whatever he does prospers. Lord Jesus, we ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon our hearts and minds this evening and upon all those who join us via media. May the words of this talk inspire and revive in us a desire to evangelize and to share the gospel, a desire to promote and reshape Catholic education, to form children as disciples of Christ, a flame in their hearts with wonder and for the desire for the true, the good, and the beautiful. May the entire parish be renewed, that all of us see ourselves as students of the great teacher, Jesus Christ. We give thanks for the Benedictine monks of Belmont Abbey and for St. Catherine Drexel for their courage as we will learn this evening, you have planted a tree of the faith in Belmont, and your church has grown over the past centuries because of the faith in the hearts of these simple monks, the Sisters of Mercy, and St. Catherine Drexel. May their example inspire us, too, to be pioneers in this great land and to spread the gospel and to evangelize the hearts for your kingdom. We offer up this time this evening to our Holy Mother as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This evening, I'd like to take a brief moment to introduce our speaker, who is himself a parishioner here at St. Michael Catholic Church, Dr. Bill Thierfelder. Dr. Thierfelder was born and raised in New York City. He is a Knight of Malta and currently lives in Gastonia. He and his wife, Mary, have 10 children, and all are parishioners here at St. Michael Catholic Church. Their youngest son is enrolled in our parish school, as well as their oldest granddaughter. Dr. Thierfelder is currently in his, in his 17th year as president of Belmont Abbey College. Under Dr. Thierfelder's leadership, enrollment has more than doubled. 30 facilities have been built or refurbished, including the addition of an off-site campus, and the college has gained national recognition for its Catholic and Benedictine mission and identity. In addition, Dr. Thierfelder has championed college affordability by reducing tuition by 33% and guaranteeing no future increases. Dr. Thierfelder received his master's and doctoral degrees in sports psychology and human movement from Boston University. He is a licensed psychologist, a diplomat of the American Board of Psychological Specialties, a member of the American College of Sports Medicine, 
and a past member of the United States Olympic Committee's Sports Psychology Registry. He is a former NCAA Division I coach, national champion, and a two-time All-American from the University of Maryland. Dr. Thurfelder has also led the fight for religious freedom and has testified before the United States Congress in matters related to religious liberty. He is the author of Less Than a Minute to Go, The Secret to World-Class Performance in Sport, Business, and Everyday Life. And now your question is, what in the world does he have to say about the beginning of Catholic Catholicism in Gaston County? And that's what he's going to do, is tell us just that. Dr. Bill Thurfelder, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Yeah, see, God has a really good sense of humor, right? What business do I have talking to you about the history of anything, right? So I am not a scholar. I'll give you that to start off with. I'm not a historian. I don't even play one on TV. So uh, again, God is good, and I trust that he will, uh, his Holy Spirit will guide us this evening as we, as we begin. You know, the, 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 the series, Hearts United, um, I think was the creation of my good wife and Jenny Ryan, uh, who came up with it, but it's, it's really just a perfect name because one, it's about our being united to the sacred and immaculate hearts. Uh, it's about our relationship with each other. It's about our hearts being united here. And what I'm hoping to convey a little bit tonight is that it's about being our hearts being united with those that came before us, that make it possible for us to be sitting here this evening. So I thought I would maybe just begin, uh, and, and let me also premise, Obviously, I don't have time, I don't even have the ability, but I don't have the time, to, and I don't think you want me to take the time to, to share with you the previous 200 years in detail of what's gone on. What I hope to do tonight is really get at the root. Um, one thing I've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed in your own lives, is that uh, we live in such a hectic time. It's so busy. I mean, despite the challenges we can get into, it's just such a busy, hectic time, and we are just racing from thing to thing. Uh, we don't have time to reflect. I, I think sometimes we think, well, that's, you know, whatever we're talking about, well, that's over there, that's them, that's that thing. It has nothing to do with us in any way. And what I'm hoping to maybe convey tonight is how much we are tied together. Um, you know, when we think of maybe Belmont Abbey and St. Michael's, we think of them as two completely different places, institutions. Sure, we share some common things, but, you know, what do we have to do with each other? And I hope to make the case to you tonight that, my gosh, we're, we're, we are one. Uh, you know, St. Michael's isn't here without Belmont Abbey because it, it's an extension of Belmont Abbey, which is why I think Father Rossi so often refers to Belmont Abbey and the Benedictines and so forth and St. Catherine Drexel because there's such a close tie uh, with us. So this is really tonight, I think, a story about the great love and sacrifice of those who made it possible for us to be here today. Um, it's also my hope that you'll leave here this, this evening overwhelmed with gratitude. Uh, gratitude to God and to those who have come before us, um, those who cooperate with God's grace to make Belmont Abbey and St. Michael Catholic Church possible. But in order to have gratitude, you've got to start with something else. You've you, you got to have humility. Um, and so it begins with the recognition that I am nothing, I know nothing, and I have nothing. You know, and sometimes when people hear me say that, they think, wow, you got low self-esteem. You know, you must have some kind of problem. And I, no, I mean, standing next to God, what am I bragging about? I mean, anything good I may have, it's a gift. It wasn't mine to begin with. So at best, I'm a steward. The same for you. You've all been blessed abundantly in your lives. Um, any good that you have, we know where it came from. So really, you're stewards as well. We're all stewards of what we've been given. And so it's really on us to say, how do, we make, how do we make good use of that? But it's that recognition first and foremost that for anything that we have in our life, anything, and we've got to slow down. That's why silence is important. We've got to reflect on what we do have in our lives. I mean, it's, we should be overwhelmed. We should almost be incapacitated by gratitude. Because if we're truly humble and we recognize 
our nothingness, not in a negative way, just the fact that everything is a gift from God, we should be overwhelmed with all that we do have. So even the smallest thing, the, the fact if you had dinner tonight, maybe you didn't have dinner yet, I hope you do, um, but if you had dinner, if you had lunch today, if you had a breakfast today, if just, you know, if you had a sip of water today, it should be overwhelming to you. But we get so used and, and so sated and so used to things that we just say, well, yeah, of course, you know, we take for granted so much in our lives. So this, this thing about gratitude, I guess I'm really emphasizing to you because I think you'll get nothing from this talk this evening. You'll get nothing from what I'm going to show you if we don't start there. If we don't really try to put ourselves in the place of those that came before us to recognize what it took for us to be here today. And if we do, then we're going to have a, a deep gratitude and a profound love. And that love then gives us the, the ability to love each other and to love all that we come in contact with. So I'll begin with the first slide here. Let me make sure I got this going so that you're not here all night. Um, let me make sure I have this going here. So this is Father Jeremiah O'Connell. Uh, he founded, I won't go through the whole story, but he was a Catholic priest and he was down in Columbia, South Carolina. He started a school, it was called St. Mary's, and timing's everything, so it was the Civil War. Uh, General Sherman came through, destroyed Atlanta, and then continued up and destroyed most of Columbia. There was also a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment and so forth there, and so for all those reasons, his school was not only destroyed, but it, it, it couldn't even be rebuilt, and so he decided to leave, and he came up here to Charlotte, where his brother, who was also a Catholic priest of all things, and I, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but North Carolina had the fewest Catholics in the, in, out of all the states in the Union, in the United States. It was estimated there was only about 700 Catholics in the whole state of North Carolina. Most of them were, uh, by the way, on the coast. They were at Wilmington. The few scattered Catholics that were here actually were working at the gold mine that was in Charlotte. There was actually a mint here and a gold mine at one time. So there were very, very few Catholics here to begin with. So he comes up here. He's with his brother. And he's always had a, a keen eye and a good mind for real estate. So he's looking around for a place that's close to Charlotte and that he's trying to figure out where's the expansion of the railroad going to come. And, and so he, he looks around and he thought that Gaston County was a perfect location for a religious community and a school in the town of Garibaldi, just outside the city. Now, for some of you, you may be saying, where the heck is Garibaldi in Gaston County? It is Belmont. Uh, Belmont became Belmont, and I'll talk about that in a little bit here, but the original name of the town was Garibaldi. And I'll tell you later why uh, Abbot Leo Hayde wanted to change that name. So to give some perspective or appreciation of the life and the time that uh, Father O'Connell lived in, I thought I'd just give you a short story related to this. And uh, going that way. Uh, this is probably hard to see because it's a drawing, uh, but it's actually uh, a ford. Now, we don't use that term anymore because most of us are not crossing streams or rivers anymore, but a ford was a place where you could cross a river where it'd be shallow enough you could get across to the other side, okay? So, Father Jeremiah, and there's a little story about him, uh, there were only, by the way, a few fords in the area, the river crossings uh, at the time, that were relatively safe to cross the Catawba River. And so a couple of miles from Belmont, was the Tuckasegee Trail and Ford, and above that in Mount Holly was the Thompson's Ford. So here's what Jer Father Jeremiah wrote about a little episode in his life, and I'm sharing this like detailed episode with you. This is a day in the life of a Catholic priest, okay? So this, I hope, starts to put you in the place of what came before us. So Father Jeremiah wrote this. He said, in the autumn of 1872, I narrowly escaped drowning in Thompson's Ford. Having reached Charlotte late on a Saturday evening on my way to officiate at the Gaston Church on Sunday, the brothers Patrick and Peter Cox met me as planned with a conveyance to bring me to their residence in the vicinity of the church, which gave me time to hear the confessions before Mass. It had rained heavily during several days, and just like now, right? Uh, arriving at the ford by dark and ascertaining that the water marks were invisible. We should have known that the river was unfordable. I was then ignorant of this caution, and on being asked if we might venture, I unhesitatingly answered in the affirmative. Looking one at another, the Cox brothers, uh, mutually inquiring if they had each said their morning prayers, and without further hesitation, my companions boldly urged their steeds into the yellow flood. 
Like the son of Amminadab, I don't know if that's the story of the Red Sea, that was the, the, the son of Amminadab was uh, Nashon. Uh, I won't go through the whole thing here. This is getting way too, too far back. But in, in the Midrash, which is the interpretation of the Jewish scholars of the Talmud, uh, it, it's, it's said that he was the one that was first leaped, leapt into the Red Sea, causing it to split. Go on, though, here. So my guides were sober, sedate men, timidly cautious of their undertakings and raised in this vicinity. If there was any danger of making the attempt, I imagine they would not have consulted one so utterly unacquainted with the crossing. I believe they were expert swimmers, and I was mistaken there also. <laughs> they were brought up in holy dread of water. Skill would have been of no avail. Even a Boyton could not prevail against the force of the giant stream. And you might say, what's a Boyton? Paul Boyton, he was known as the fearless frogman, and he was a famous swimmer and showman adventurer. So he's saying even him, he, he couldn't have gotten across this, right? So the night was densely dark, and we were floated down the current like a feather. One of the riders swam his horse towards me, transferring my person from the buggy. The generous steed, as if conscious of danger, nobly breasted the headlong tide. After having been drifted down a considerable distance, I finally reached the opposite bank in safety, aided by the overhanging willows. I crept out and was saved. Floundering and pawing, man and horse turned back and braved the danger anew. To discover, if possible, aid, uh, our lost companion, for we were, part, we were parted midway. In an agony of prayer, I besought the mother of God for their preservation. The ford was several hundred yards wide, Nothing could be seen and no sound heard except the dull, deep roar of the waters combining the boisterous voices of many a mountain torrent from afar. You could tell he was an Irish, right? I mean, he, you know, this elegance of telling me about the stream and the water, right? Before reaching the shoals where death would have been inevitable, the traces and harnesses dropped from the horse as if parted by an invisible hand. Peter Cox sprung on the animal's back and effected his escape. The vehicle and its precious contents were swept away. After a death-like suspense, horses and riders approached, spent and wearied. On my stating the rashness of the undertaking, to my astonishment, I was answered that they knew the dangers, that no one ever before was known to have crossed the Catawba safely from this place, and under the circumstances that our preservation was a miraculous interposition. Referring to the Cox brothers, he wrote, taught to believe in the priest and obey him implicitly, they concluded that the feat must be accomplished and never doubted for once the result. <laughs> Later, after the congregation had assembled, they and many others in the vicinity set out to search for the wreck. It was discovered at a considerable distance, high and dry, landed on the shoals of the Tuckasegee Ford near Fights Mill. Nothing, not even a strap of the harness was missing. Nothing more was needed to make a day forever memorable in Gaston. This is like his life. I mean, he's riding around circuits of these churches. He's like fording streams on horsebacks, pulling himself on willow trees up onto a shore. This is like one day in his life. So it's important for us to recognize that, you know, what we, what we sometimes think are hardships uh, pale compared to something that they had to go through. Um, Samuel Caldwell, he was born in Orange County, uh, North Carolina in 1759, he first entered military service in 1776. He was many, in many important Revolutionary War battles, including the Battle of King's Mountain and the Battle of the Cowpens. After the war, uh, Captain Caldwell settled on a farm three miles southeast of the Cuckasegee Ford, where he raised a large family. By the way, that farm is Belmont Abbey. Um, he was a kind and obliging neighbor, attained a good old age, and is buried in the graveyard of Goshen Church in Gaston County. Many years later, after the Civil War had ended, the 700-acre property was auctioned off for back taxes. Uh, the economy was in a shambles, obviously, after the war. It was auctioned off. Father O'Connell put a bid in on it. He lost. The guy who won couldn't pay. They came back to him shortly after and said, are you still interested? He said yes, and he bought the 700 acres for $10. So he did have a shrewd eye for real estate. I mean, he, he, he was ahead of his time there. Um, now, he was also a, a, a true Irishman. So I don't know if you can all see this. If, you, if you've got a copy of that booklet, you'll see photographs in there. Uh, this is 1874. <laughs> and uh, you can see in 1874, there is nothing there but 
fields and trees and, 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 and not much else you know, going on. But here's what Father Jeremiah wrote. Uh, you talk about an Irishman embellishing things, right? Nowhere on the continent, said Father Jeremiah, could be found another place better suited for a religious and educational institution than this. In reality, it was a sheer wilderness with a few narrow trails on it. Uh, couldn't grow a thing on it, okay? And it's hard to imagine today living at this time, and it was an extreme challenge just to provide for your food, clothing, and shelter. Um, you know, survival was a 24-7 effort. Father O'Connell went on. He offered the land as a gift to any order who would cultivate it, and with God's blessing, make it a religious center around which Catholicity would grow. Um, he tried giving this away. Uh, Nobody would take it. He tried giving it to the Jesuits, Redemptorists, and a host of others. They all said, no, why would we go to North Carolina? There's no Catholics. How are we going to support ourselves? So somehow the invitation goes to Cardinal Gibbons, who's up in Baltimore. And I, I say God has a good sense of humor, right? So Cardinal Gibbons offers this property to these German-speaking monks from Bavaria that are up in Pennsylvania. Uh, there are no German-speaking people here. Okay, and there's no Catholics here. And the only reason they came from Bavaria was to serve the German-speaking, uh, you know, Americans that were here now that didn't have any clergy, Catholic clergy. So why he said yes, I have no idea, but he did. He sends down one monk. Uh, let me see here. That's, that's Cardinal Gibbons. Uh, this, is, this is Archbishop Wimmer, uh, who was a remarkable man in his own right. Uh, he, he's the one that led them from Bavaria to the United States. But he, he ends up saying, yes, boy, he, he looks like a rough guy. I mean, he looks like this was a, you know, a, a real journey to, to, uh, from La Trobe to North Carolina. Father Herman comes down, this is, you know, in 1876. I don't know how it happens. He passes through Richmond, he picks up two students. I don't know how enrollment worked back then, but that just seems a little strange to me. So he picks up these two students, they continue down, and they arrive on the property April 21st, 1876, and they start class the day they arrive. There is nothing on this property but two shacks with holes in the roof. That is the beginning of Belmont Abbey. So it, it, you know, it, it's, it has a storied past and certainly not a glorious one to begin with. So from the beginning, let me keep up with myself here, um, the Abbey was dedicated to the Blessed Mother, and it was in the name of Mary Help. As a matter of fact, I, I think I have it up there. Maria Stein uh, was the, the German uh, for Mary Help. Uh, in 1877, Mary Help of Christians officially became the patroness of the Abbey, and really indirectly the patroness of the Apostolic Nullius in North Carolina. Now, you may not be familiar with that phrase, Apostolic Nullius. There were no dioceses in North Carolina because there were no Catholics, for the most part, in North Carolina. Anything that existed uh, was basically there might be a priest who would travel through the area, and they might not, you know, a, Catholics may not see a priest for three, four, five, six months sometimes uh, in terms of just having a mass and being able to receive the sacraments. So it, it's, it's a remarkable story of this thing called an apostolic nullius. So it was because there were no dioceses, it was created. And I'm going to show you a little bit in a moment here. But again, just to show you, you know, that's, that's the first chapel uh, that the monks built in 1877. Uh, you know, it's just amazing what people can create and do who are motivated and driven uh, with a great purpose. The, sorry, I keep going the wrong way there. Um, also, to kind of give some time frame here, most of you, if you have a scapula, you'll often have the Jubilee Medal of Monte Cassino on it. It's, it's a Benedictine medal. Some of you may or may not know the, the St. Benedict Medal is the most indulged medal in the Catholic Church. Uh, it's also considered the Exorcism Medal. And so this is, this is a, Believe it or not, a drawing. Uh, Father McInerney, who I'll talk about here in a moment, uh, was an architect. He became an architect and uh, created St. Michael's. He built the abbey. I mean, it, all these designs of churches that you'll see around, he, he was the one that did it. But that's actually a drawing of the Jubilee Medal. And I think sometimes we think of these things as being some kind of, uh, you know, in antiquity, you know, these medals existed. This medal wasn't created until four years after Belmont Abbey began. So it gives you an idea, perspective, and I, my family will tell you, because I, I think I relate everything to Belmont Abbey, time-wise. Right? So if anything's happening, I say 1776, okay, 1876, okay, what, what was going on? And then it starts to give you a perspective on, wow, what's happened since then? So this was a drawing, again, that he had done. Um, keep going the wrong way. Abbot Leo Hayde. Uh, in 1885, um, I was going to say, after several failed attempts to find an abbot, 
you would think they gladly came down here and said, hey, this is just wonderful being down here. Um, Father Wolf came first. He wrote a lot of letters home to Latrobe saying, this is untenable. Uh, we cannot live here. This is uninhabitable. I don't know how we're going to live here. We're never going to make it. Uh, we're all going to die. Uh, you know, so uh, I think the answer to that was a few more monks got sent down. Uh, so, you know, to, to give him a hand, they got there and thought, this is incredibly bad. Uh, and so they could not, they, they actually had said, oh, you know, Archbishop Wim said, so-and-so, you're going to be the abbot. He said, I'm not, I'm not going to be the abbot. And, uh, you know, <laughs> he, he didn't accept being abbot at the time. So after several failed attempts to find the first abbot of Mary help, Divine Providence presented a most unlikely candidate in Father Leo Hade. He was officially made or elected abbot in 1885. Um, again, you may know this or, or not, but the way a monastic community is formed, an actual abbey is formed, is it starts with a priory usually first. So you have to get up to where you have 10 monks before you can actually have an abbey. So they finally had 10 monks there that were willing to stay. Um, I think there was a little grumbling, which is in the rule of St. Benedict, and no, no, you're not supposed to, you know, no grumbling, mumbling, right? You know? um, there were a few, though, that weren't very happy. Uh, but he became abbot, and uh, again, no diocese. It's just this apostolic nullius. So Abbot Leo Hade was the first bishop and abbot of North Carolina. Uh, this apostolic nullius was territory of North Carolina, uh, and he had the incredible job of, of doing both. And I'd often say he, he has to be at the right hand of God right now because he couldn't win. Uh, the priests that were around in the state uh, that now reported to him felt like he favored the monks. He had to travel all over the place, so the monks felt like he favored you know, all the other priests that were around. And so I don't know how he won, but he was an amazing man, a holy man, uh, a, a tremendous speaker from what I've heard. Uh, and he was able to, to build what you see today before you. Uh, in the first months up there, I'll put up that, uh, at the Abbey, Abbot Leo Hade was walking through, and this is the shield of uh, Belmont Abbey. And you'll see that tree in the middle, and you may wonder what that's about. And uh, there it is. So if you have the booklet, you can maybe see it more clearly in the, in the picture. But if you look in the middle of this photograph, you'll see that there's a tree. It's the only one that actually has any green on it. All the other <laughs> leaves are gone. I don't know what time of year this was. But the only green tree there is the one in the middle. That's actually a cedar tree. And there was a monk about to cut it down. And Abbot Leo saw this, and he just yelled out the word Crescott. And Crescott's the Latin word for let it grow. And so that became the motto of, of Belmont Abbey, uh, of, of the monastic community. But it also, I think, was really his, his motto and his vision for all of North Carolina, Catholicism in North Carolina. It was let it grow. And so they took on an incredible uh, task of, of doing this. Uh, it was amazing to me what he was able to do with his energy and just dedication but he founded monasteries, parishes, and schools, not only in North Carolina, but in Georgia, Florida, and, and Virginia. So there's many schools, like St. Leo's down in Florida came from Belmont Abbey. It's, just, it's amazing to me what they were able to do with so little. They didn't have anything. And they did not have anything. Um, as I said, they, they lived in shacks at first when they got there. Uh, let me move us on here. So there is the first 10 monks. Uh, they're there. That, that comprises the entire college of St. Mary's. And by the way, you might say, well, St. Mary's, I'm going back to the Belmont story in a moment. We started out as St. Mary's College. That's what it was. So th this is the faculty of St. Mary's College. Looks like a happy group, uh, you know. And by the way, they did everything. There was a farm that they had to take care of. Uh, you know, they had the buildings, they had the teaching. Uh, you know, all of this was amazing to me. And just to touch on the, the, the Belmont piece of this thing, it, it became officially Belmont Abbey in 1913. And so what happened is uh, Garibaldi was the name of the town. You may or may not know the name, but there was a Giuseppe Garibaldi. Uh, he was, uh, you know, a, a Freemason and anti-Catholic and had actually attacked the Vatican and... Uh, attacked the Pope. The Pope actually had to flee at one point out of Rome. And so Abbot Leo Hay didn't think fondly of the name Garibaldi. And so he decided that that name has to change. 
So I would say he went to consult the town fathers, but I think there was only one, okay? Because it, in, in down in Garibaldi, there was basically a, a track for the train to go through, and there was a little shed there that was the one stop, you know, whistle stop that they had. That was about it, and that was the, that was the, the father of uh, Garibaldi. So he sat down with him and, and kind of negotiated and said, look, if you'll change the name, and he, by the way, he, he, he tried, he, he you know, how about we call the town St. Mary's? <laughs> uh, that didn't go over with the non-Catholics that were here, so they, they didn't go for that one. So he said, well, if you'll change the name, I'll change the name of St. Mary's to what we decide on. So they ended up with Belmont. There's all kinds of stories about where that came from. Uh, it's assumed it was either from the Latin or from the Italian um, beautiful mountain. Um, and I don't know if they saw Crowder's. There's not much of a mountain at Belmont. I think we have about 800 foot, feet of elevation. Um, but for whatever reason, they agreed upon Belmont, and so it became Belmont Abbey and the town of Belmont. Uh, as you'll see here, the cornerstone, 1886. This is actually the cornerstone of the what's now the administration building. Uh, and Abbot Leo Hayde, when he was blessing this cornerstone of this building, he said, the work and prayers here shall spread God's blessing over this beautiful country in the years to come, when perhaps few of you who are listening to me now shall be among the living. I think that's incredible. The work and prayers here, that's the aura et labor of the Benedictines. Um, but you ask, well, how, how's it gonna spread God's blessing over this beautiful country in the years to come? And it was the fruit of their work. It was the students, it was the parishioners, it was the parishes, all of you, you are the fruits that he saw spreading God's blessing over this beautiful country in the years to come. And I'm amazed at his prophetic uh, you know, tone and, and, and sentiment when he said, when perhaps few of you who are listening to me now shall be among the living. So I'm saying it to you right now out loud, and someday we're not gonna be here anymore. And we gotta pray and hope and you know, trust that there's gonna be even more of us here, right? There's gonna be more taking our place and growing you know, Catholicism and the, the fullness of truth here in North Carolina. Um, there's a little, again, shot, so again, I hope you can see this from a distance, but there's two like white structures there in the forefront of the photo. The one on the right is actually the first church, the first chapel that they had, uh, that I showed you the picture of inside. The little white hut <laughs> that's there, uh, that's where Father Jeremiah O'Connell lived. Uh, until one night he burned it down, and then he had to go live with the monks in, inside the monastery. But he had wanted his own little place. That was part of the agreement of the land, is that he would at least be provided for in some way. Um, but that didn't last very long. The, uh, again, just for perspective, this is the road to Charlotte. I mean, we think of, you know, we got problems with 85 or Billy Graham or, you know, other things. I mean, Imagine every day being stuck in that for, you know, six hours. I mean, it, it's amazing. I don't know how clearly you can see it. There's like wagon wheel trails on this thing here. I mean, this is, this is horses and wagons. Uh, this is wilderness that we're talking about. So we, again, I think just assume everything's always been there and, you know, maybe we don't reflect often enough and go back to gratitude of how did all this, how did all this get here? How did, how did we come to have what we have here today? And it's these individuals who... You talk about rugged, you know, pioneerism of some kind, uh, holiness, uh, to come and, and build something in this is, is really remarkable to me. Uh, and this is the, uh, the grotto. It's uh, an interesting story on the grotto. Again, I don't know, some of you probably know the story, some of you may not know the story. There was a, a monk by the name of Francis Myers, Father Francis Myers, and he was dying of typhoid. Uh, I think it was 18, 1891, and uh, he had been ill for several weeks, and he reached a point where the doctor said, there's nothing more I can do, and thought he was within hours of dying, maybe a day of dying. And so the monks implored and stormed heaven and prayed to Our Lady of Lords and said, you know, if you will, if you will intercede and, uh, you know, ask for a healing for Father Francis, uh, we will build you a grotto here, a grotto of lords. And the next day, completely recovered, Father Francis gets up and they say, okay, I guess we owe the Blessed Mother a grotto. So they went down, dug out the ground there. I mean, they created this themselves and put that in. Um, now, what's really interesting to me about this photo, and, I, and it may be difficult to see from back there. Again, there's, there's handouts, so if you can take those with you tonight. 
the very right corner, there is a priest sitting on the bench. That is Father Jeremiah O'Connell. Uh, so he must have been looking at this thinking, wow, there was nothing here, and now there's a grotto, and you can see some structures up top. So he's probably thinking to himself, this is, this is wonderful. This is, like, this is incredible. Uh, but even to this day, and I don't know if many of you know this, this is an actual shrine for vocations in North Carolina. Isn't that amazing? And I'll finish today with where we are in that regard. Uh, so again, here they are <laughs> in 1983, uh, 1893, I should say. Um, this comprised the whole faculty. So again, farm, school, monastery, the, the local parishes, you know, and they prayed eight times a day. They stopped to pray eight times a day. And, and, and Benedictines, you know, they, they, were, they were strict. They really adhered to it. They could be working in the field. When it was time for prayer, when they heard the bell, they just stopped what they were doing. There was no like, hey, let me just finish this. They stopped and they went to prayer. Uh, so to pray eight times a day and to do all that they're doing almost seems superhuman to me. I mean, it's, it's certainly some kind of grace that, that they were cooperating with from my perspective. Here is the oldest existing photo of the, to be honest, what's the cathedral? I don't know if you all realize that either. Um, this was the only Abbey Cathedral ever in the history of the United States. Uh, a place is called a cathedral because it's where the bishop is. So Abbot Leo Hayde being bishop, this was the cathedral. So many people have said to me over the years, wow, why couldn't we have kept it like this, you know, compared to what it came to? Well, there's basically two reasons for it. Uh, one is by 1960 or 65, it was falling apart. There were termites, wood rot, it, it wasn't safe. They, they had to do something. The second one worked against us. It was 1960, 65. Uh, not the highlight of architectural design. Uh, hideous, actually, in, in the 60s, but that's when it all happened, right? I think what saved us, actually, in the Basilica is the beautiful fused, they aren't stained glass windows in the Basilica, they're actually fused paintings. Uh, they actually won the blue ribbon in the 1892 World's Fair. Uh, they're gorgeous. They're, they're incredible. And then you have the beautiful statue of Mary Help of Christians up on the altar. And uh, if you haven't figured out Benedictine time yet, they have a 1,500-year view of things. So since the day I arrived, I was always like, do you think we could get a crucifix, you know, like over the, over the center of the altar there, you know? Um, so 17 years later, my prayers have been answered. Uh, there is a beautiful crucifix there that is inspiring to me and just feels like the, the basilica is wrapped around it at this point. So, uh, but that, that is the reason for the change. It wasn't somebody saying, hey, we don't like this anymore. We're going to go something else. It, it was sort of out of necessity. If the timing had been different, it probably would have been. If it had happened like 20 years earlier, it probably would have looked more similar to something like this. Uh, this, by the way, so when they, when they built the new basilica, uh, this is the old abbey or church of Mary Help, and it was completed uh, when the new one was completed. So this, this was St. Benedict Church originally uh, on, the, on the abbey, and it was converted to St. Benedict School in 1894. It was an elementary school for black children who were barred from attending the county's segregated academies for white children. Father Melchior, uh, one of the monks, oversaw the school, and the Sisters of Mercy taught the classes. Father Melchior went on to become, I don't know if you know this or not, he was the first pastor of St. Michael's. Uh, so he's in the doorway there, a uh, relatively young-looking guy uh, at that time. And the Sisters of Mercy, interesting about them, uh, if you all know where the Sisters of Mercy are at this point, the, the Benedictine monks gave them that property, and the buildings that are on there, they actually built uh, matter of fact, the, the buildings, these buildings, every building on the abbey, uh, well, let's say since uh, the, the early 1900s, all of those buildings, they didn't exist. Those monks literally dug up the red clay, they formed them into bricks, they dried them in the sun, Father McInerney designed the buildings, and they built those buildings themselves. It, it, it's, to me, that's remarkable. They actually made the bricks and never mind they did the building of it. Uh, they did the same thing here, the same building. They actually built and made those bricks and, and built that building. Uh, but the Sisters of Mercy, they were given the land and the buildings that are on there, the, 
the monks actually made the bricks and built the buildings for them. And uh, my understanding uh, is that the sisters weren't completely happy with it when they arrived because the, the brothers had forgotten to put doors on the buildings. And the sisters wanted some doors. I don't know why, you know. Um, I guess the brothers didn't think that was a, you know, that was a detail that, you know, they could get to at another time. So, so again, it's remarkable. The Sisters of Mercy had been in, in North Carolina, but Abbot Leo and Haid had asked them to come to this area. So that, and as you probably know, they, they were incredible in their work with you know, schools and education and so forth. And so they actually taught at, at this school as well. Uh, again, to give you a little feel, this is Main Street in downtown Gastonia. And I think this is 18, 1897. I don't know about you. I mean, that's not that long ago in a way. And I mean, it's a dirt. It's just dirt. It's not even level dirt. I mean, it's just like they scraped, <laughs> scraped it out, put in some trees along there, probably to tie your horses up to and have some shade so the horses didn't die in the middle of the summer, you know, when they had to stop for something. Uh, but what a different life. I mean, taking care of your horses, you know, feeding your horses each night. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, Again, I try to have appreciation for this. And, this. and by the way, this was probably considered the metropolis. I mean, they have some telephone, I mean, you know, telephone wires and electric wires going on up there. So this was, this was probably like, wow, this is like the big city at this point. And then in 1900, uh, there was what I'd call the Great Fire. Um, let me see where I'm at, I'm at here. Uh, this is the administration building and the entire building burned except for the actual structure of the building. Uh, you'll actually see it maybe a little bit better here. All that was left was the shell of this building. And I don't know how they did this. I, I, their, their, their work ethic, their, their ability to accomplish this is amazing to me. In a matter of months, they rebuilt this so they could start school in the fall. And I know we've done a few, like, Real, <laughs> real efforts in our school, right? So, so you're following a really good tradition, you know, in the things that you're doing. You're not alone. This isn't the first, right? There's others who have done this as well. But it, to me, it's just remarkable that they were able to do that in a matter of months to rebuild that building so that they could... And by the way, that building now has mostly classrooms and administrative offices and so forth. That was everything. That was where the students lived. That was where they ate. That was where they went to class. I mean, this, this was the school. If they didn't have that, there, there would have been no school. So I've somehow like, brought myself back here. So where am I? Um, well, we get to St. Michael's. So I believe this year we're celebrating our, what is it, 118th uh, anniversary. Let me see if I can find my way through here. Uh, sorry. I'll keep going. I'll, I'll, I kind of know it anyway, but so I just didn't want to leave some things out. So uh, I thought this was an interesting little artifact. Uh, this is actually a document uh, that was probably written by Father Melchior. Uh, it says, dedicated by uh, Reverend, the right Reverend Leo Hayde, uh, assisted by several fathers from St. Mary's College, and the first Holy Mass celebrated by Father Melchior. Um, that was in 1903. So that, that was the beginning of St. Michael's. And uh, Father Melchior, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, but, you know, just to finish again, Abbot Leo Hayde was remarkable in just his support and, and, and how he was able, to, it was also almost like the multiplication of the loaves, you know, how are they able to do all of these things at the same time is, is really remarkable to me. That's, that's Father Melchior, your first, your first pastor uh, for St. Michael's, uh, and he was a remarkable man, too. I mean, he, he actually spent, uh, I think it was three years getting it ready for the dedication. So he started in 1900, and by 1903, the church was built and they were ready for the actual dedication. Um, and I think, uh, oh, sorry, I'm jumping by. Uh, here's St. Catherine Drexel. Uh, you may know, and I love that you have the painting outside of, of St. Catherine Drexel. Do you realize that a saint, a saint of the Catholic Church actually helped build St. Michael's Church and School. I mean, that, that, again, an appreciation for that is, you know, it's amazing to me. And she was the one who gave money to actually help finish the basilica uh, with the monks over at the abbey. And the reason she did that, by the way, 
is that, uh, as you may know, with St. Catherine Drexel, her, her uh, kind of apostolate was for the care of African Americans and American Indians. And Abbot Leo Hayde had requested from her some funds to finish. She was an heiress. She was very, very wealthy and then became a, a sister and gave her life to that. And so used all her funds really for the welfare of others. But one stipulation was that she'd only support places that would be integrated, not segregated. And because the monks were integrated, like for example, the, the St. Benedict School and so forth, and they're willing to dedicate part of the church for African Americans to be able to attend church with the whites that were here, um, that's why she gave the money to, to the monks. And that's why she gave the money here. And so it's really remarkable that these monks are still alive. Uh, when you think about it. Uh, you know, here they are in the middle of the Bible Belt, in the middle of the South. Uh, there's not only anti-Catholicism, but there's a tremendous prejudice and so forth. I mean, it, it's, it's remarkable the work that they did and the lives that they, that they led. Uh, and so St. Catherine, to me, it's, it, it's amazing that she's part of our... I mean, this isn't some name of some saint that sort of is out there. This is someone who intimately is involved with St. Michael's. Uh, not every church can say that they have an actual saint who participated in the life of their, their parish and school. This is the first St. Michael's Church in 1906. And uh, it's on Longwood Ave uh, over in Gastonia. And you can just see there's nothing around it. I mean, I, I know it doesn't come back, but I mean, it is dirt. There looks like there's tumbleweed, you know, outside of it. Uh, but you just see the love of people, you know, to do what it takes to create that church, to allow them to have a parish life and to you know, have the sacraments here. I mean, it, it's, it's, again, it's a tribute to all those who came before us. We're following in, in their steps. And uh, this picture I put up for you because, again, I, I, you probably think I'm a crazy person because I'm in such awe of things, right? But I, I am. I mean, this is amazing to me. So this is 1907. I showed you a picture a few slides ago of the building that was gutted by fire. <laughs> There's nothing in the building, right? By 1907, not only had they repaired that entire building, they built an extension onto it. And if you look to the very far right of that photo, you'll see St. Leo's. They built St. Leo's in the same time. This is, by the way, when they built St. Michael's Church. How did they do all of this in this short amount of time? Imagine somebody telling us, I want you to put up like three more buildings. I want you to build a church over here. I want you to man a parish. I want we'd be like, are you, you're crazy, like that's impossible. And by the way, they didn't have a fortune. They, they called together little things. Ab Abbot Leo Hay would go around speaking and you know, try to do you know, whatever he could to raise a little bit of money. So they did not have a lot, and yet they did so much. I mean, it, it's amazing to me what they were able to do. Um, let's see. There they are again, and I, I only bring them up because it's, again, from the very beginning, the, the Abbey, the college, St. Michael's, everybody that was related to them, uh, really depended upon the monastic community to provide support and services for the entire institutions, like for all the institutions, everything. They did everything. And this was also true of their generosity in providing for the parishes throughout North Carolina. And by the way, to the detriment of their own monastery and monastic life. I think one thing that we have to pray for and, and be thankful for is that you have to realize monastics are not diocesan priests. They have their own call. Their vocation is to come to one place, and they believe by coming there together and by working and living together and worshiping in community, they are going to come to a, a deeper, more profound love of God. That's why they do it. So what they were willing to do is give up. That was what they're called to. And, and you know, Father Rossi can tell you, I mean, it's not the same call. To be in a monastic community is very different than, than being a diocesan priest. Uh, even, even to be a, a, an ordered priest who can travel around and be transferred here and there, they not only have a vocation, they have a vocation to one place forever. Can you imagine you making that, you know, say, okay, I'm never leaving this place. This is where I will always be. Wow. I mean, it's enough to have the vocation to the priesthood or, you know, or, or religious life. But to say I'm going to do it in one place forever is remarkable to me. So, so they gave up so much to create places like St. Michael's, to man this as a parish. That was not what they were originally called to, but they did it out of love for us. And so in some ways, it was great detriment to their community 
Because they're, they're, you can imagine the disruption to a community that has to have monks constantly leaving some living away from the monastery in order to make sure the parish and, and parishioners were served. Uh, so always keep them in your thoughts and prayers. So sometimes we can look back and say, well, why did this happen? They, they gave up a lot to make this happen. Um, again, here's the 1910. They keep growing. That, that, that was great. Uh, you can, it's a little dark picture there, but, uh, you know, again, a, a great group. Uh, I love reading about each of their lives. Uh, again, just a picture in there to give it perspective. You know, they're bringing in the harvest. Uh, and by the way, everybody brought in the harvest. The monks, the students, uh, local neighbors and so forth. And whatever they had, they shared. So there'd be people in Gaston County that didn't have enough food. They would provide for them through their harvest. So, uh, you know, just picture the life. We're thinking, no, I just go to school or I just go to work. Imagine if you had to do it all. You, you, got, you got to make your own food. You got to make your own house. You got to do everything. And on top of that, you're also going to do whatever other apostolate you think you may be called to. Uh, the St. Benedict statue that you see in front of the Basilica now, for, I'm hoping all of you have been to the Abbey before, so there's a, you know, the white statue of St. Benedict out in front of the Basilica. Um, this was originally it. It came from Italy. Uh, it was imported from Italy, and uh, it was 1924, and it's where the brothers worked and recited that they first had placed it. It was also one of the last uh, public ceremonies or blessings of Abbot Leo Hade. And a matter of fact, that same, I think the very next year, or maybe it was in that same year, he actually passed. This is his funeral. You can see the drapings, the black drapings and so forth. Uh, people came from all over. Uh, he was really loved far and wide, even outside of North Carolina. Many people came uh, for his funeral. The, uh, this is the monastery in 1924. And uh, again, every, every one of these monks in this photo are not here anymore. Every one of those monks is buried out in our cemetery. If you go over to that cemetery, you will see the lines of tombstones of all the monks who have come before us. So, you know, each one of them is like us. You know, each one had a life. Each had skills and talents and abilities and, you know, worked hard and loved and desired. And, and they gave themselves completely. Uh, and, you know... They're, they're pointing the way for us. That's why, by the way, I like cemeteries. I'm not a morbid person. A cemetery always reminds me, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, what am I thinking? You know, I know where I'm going. I know this is the billionth of a second. So it reminds me of where I'm going. And just seeing them reminds me of what we're called to in our own lives and what they were willing to do for us in terms of their lives and their sacrifice. Uh, this is Abbot Vincent Taylor. Uh, he was the second abbot of Belmont Abbey, uh, 1924. Uh, up in the right-hand corner of this, again, if you don't have the booklet, it may be hard to see, but up in the right-hand corner is actually the white church. You'll see it there. That's on Longwood Avenue. Uh, that was the first St. Michael's Church. You can see in 30 years, a lot developed. Remember that I showed you the dirt road? There was nothing on it. That, that's Gastonia. They were pretty industrious. A lot, a lot happened in, in roughly 30 years. And then at the Abbey, it's amazing, you know, how <laughs> divine providence works. Uh, one of the monks knew somebody in the Yankees, and so the Yankees would stop every year uh, on their way to spring training. Uh, they would play a game with the, the Abbey students who all played baseball. And by the way, at one point, it was one of the requirements of being at Belmont Abbey. It was all boys. You had to play baseball. I mean, it wasn't a choice whether you could play or not. You were going to play baseball. Um, but this was a great day. You could see the joy of, you know, welcoming uh, Babe Ruth. And so uh, it was great for the Yankees, too, because many of them were Catholic, and they enjoyed their time with the monks. And so it was, it was wonderful for the students and for the Yankees and for the monks. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, this is uh, Abbot Walter Coggin. Um, this is in 1936. Uh, he was Walter Arthur Coggin at the time. Uh, he had won the Bishop Hayde Athletic Trophy. Uh, which was the Abbey's most prestigious sports award, and it was given to the best all-around athlete. He was also captain of the football team, the class valedictorian, and future Benedictine priest, abbot, and president of Belmont Abbey College. I'd also say his football team in 1936 was undefeated and unscored upon, and they were the junior college national champions. So we were, we've been undefeated ever since, uh, because we... I don't think we're bringing back football anytime soon. I, you know, I, I'm not sure. Uh, again, just a picture, 1940, and I put this one in because, you know, by 1940, I showed you Gastonia and so forth, so you really think everything's really built up at this point. 
That's it. I mean, that is the campus right there. I don't think you can see the bottom of that photo, but at the bottom of that photo is the actual road. So if you've been on our campus, you know this sort of a perimeter road that goes around the inside of the campus. That was actually the main road. Uh, Abbey Lane, which everybody walks down through the trees, that, that road curved around and went down Abbey Lane. That was the road that people, if you had a car, that's where you drove. So, I mean, cars are passing like, you know, 20 feet from the side of St. Leo's. This, this was the road. So Belmont Mount Holly Road was not there yet. Uh, but you look around it, that's it. The buildings, that's all there, there are. That's a lot, but that's all there is. Look back there, there's nothing. I mean, there's, that's just, it looks like water, but that's actually just land. And uh, it, it's amazing to me, even in 1940, to some degree, how underdeveloped that was. Um, here, oops, sorry, jumped past it. 1943, this is the first St. Michael's School. Uh, it was, you know, on the corner of York Street and Jackson Ave, and uh, this was over 75 years ago. So we have a real storied history here uh, of education, of providing an excellent education. And then this is, uh, I passed them. Now, you've had so many pastors here, and they were all Benedictine monks. Um, I didn't, I just thought, I, I can't go through everybody. So what I did is I picked out Father Eichenlaub because Father Eichenlaub, as you can read by the numbers up there, was here from 1944 to 1975. Sorry about that. Hope that's not. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, on the left side, that's Father Eichenlaub when he was a baseball player and student at Belmont Abbey. Uh, that's in 1920. 1921, he's ordained a priest. Uh, that's Father Eichenlaub sitting on the porch of the Longwood Rectory. Uh, I think that was in like 19, let's see, 1948. And then down below, he had had, uh, that was after his first heart attack. He wasn't allowed to get around, I guess, the campus here too much. So they decided to get him a three-wheeler. Uh, I'm looking at that three-wheeler and thinking that probably would give him another heart attack because that, that doesn't look like it's give, giving him any extra help getting around the campus. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, and then, you know, finally, the last photo, he gets a four-wheeler. Uh, you know, he's, he's actually in a wheelchair. This is 1975, and they're looking at the bell. That bell actually came from uh, St. Mary's, the first St. Michael's, uh, not St. Mary's, the first St. Michael church over on Longwood Ave. That was the bell from the church, and it was dedicated to Father Eichenlaub for his in incredible service. He was here for over 30 years at, at St. Michael's. So I kind of used him as the representative of all the pastors, the loving pastors that you've had here, uh, and uh, again, I can only hope Father Rossi has another 25 years in him. I, I, we look, we're looking for a new record, right? We've got we to surpass Father Eichenlaub here. Um, I'm going to finish up here. I, I, just a, a couple more maybe to go through. Um, Bishop Fulton Sheen uh, was involved with the Abbey, uh, sent down. He was good friends with uh, Abbot Vincent Taylor, Bishop uh, Abbot Vincent Taylor. And uh, again, just you don't think of these associations with, you know, us down here as Catholics, but Fulton Sheen was here. He sent Father John Bradley to help at first with our philosophy department, uh, and then later Father John Bradley came back and actually was president of Belmont Abbey College, I think, for eight years. Again, I'm going to kind of maybe just jump through here because I know we're going to wrap up. Um, 1952, uh, there's the new St. Michael's School. <laughs> 1952. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, that's 69 years ago. Now, I know we've made some enhancements to it, and we've fixed some things up and expanded a little bit, but uh, it does give you some perspective. Um, th th this is meaningful. It's not that we just happen to have some building over there and we, we sort of do some education. I guess what I'm hoping to get across to you is that these, these Benedictines believed in education. They believed the importance of a Catholic education, and they were willing to give their lives and sacrifice to ensure that that would happen here to the point that they built that. Father McInerney designed it. Um, he had gone more to the limestone at this point and uh, flat roofs and so forth. Uh, this is... Uh, Frank Sheed, who's a famous uh, uh, publisher and author who was here in the 1950s. And then 1958, that is the new church. <laughs> uh, this is the new, new church, but that was the new church and rectory that was put in. And again, Father McInerney designed that. Uh, again, it, it, these things to me are, are remarkable to see. Abbot Walter Coggins was made abbot in 1960. He was the one that got the valedictorian and you know, all those things that I shared with you earlier. Um, Here's a perspective for you. Uh, people may think, oh, well, you know, 85, you know, that's no big deal that's going by the Abbey. These are Benedictine monks. They're not into, 
wealth. They're, they're not looking to have Lamborghinis. Um, they, they came to pray and, and have silence and so forth. And so the federal government came. That is all their land. As far as you can see down that picture, that is all their land. And the federal government came in and said, we're putting an interstate highway <laughs> right next to your monastery. And for anybody that stands over there at night, it is loud. All you hear is trucks roaring by there. And at first, you don't hear it when you first walk over. But if you stand still, even during the day, you will hear the trucks. And this is what they hear 24-7. So God bless them. You know, God provides for us in all ways. Uh, this is 1962. This is Father Abbot uh, Walter, Bishop Walter Coggins. He was actually uh, at, at Vatican II. He was uh, one of the church fathers that was there. Um, so again, you know, little old Gastonia and, you know, these Benedictine monks that are here that start St. Michael's, they're also, here they are uh, in Rome. Um, Billy Graham was here. He was good friends with Cuthbert Allen. Uh, we actually gave him an honorary degree in 1967. Uh, Bill Bennett was here, Secretary of Education. And again, I, I just picked out a few of them just to show you that it, it's been a remarkable. We, we've, we've attracted people to, to the Catholic life here. Uh, Abbot Placid, you know, uh, incredibly brilliant, gifted man. Uh, just, I, I think he speaks five or six languages. Uh, he can converse with you in Latin or Greek or Hebrew or German or, you know, Italian and, and maybe a couple of others. Uh, we are blessed to have him. He's a holy, good man, priest, abbot. Uh, takes incredibly seriously the rule that he is going to stand before God at the end of his life and be accountable for all the souls under his care. Uh, he never writes anybody off, no matter what. I'm Irish. You know, we came from the thing where you strike a line through somebody's name. You know, like they, they cross you, like strike a line through. I've learned from Abbot Placid, okay, I stopped. I don't cross lines anymore. I, 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 I try to do the right thing and develop that relationship and do the best that I can. Um, I'm getting here, I just one or two slides more. Uh, I, I just thought it was great juxtaposition. So that, that vocation shrine I told you about was established in 1874. And then here we are in 2016 with the establishment of St. Joseph College Seminary. All those seminarians get their degrees from Belmont Abbey College. Uh, that is an answer to prayers. I mean, it took over 140 years, but what is that shrine for? That shrine is for vocations in North Carolina. I mean, do you need any clearer vision that divine providence is at work um, than to know that we have now, you know, seminarians? And by the way, we have the seminarians from Raleigh also on our campus as well, and hopefully that'll, that'll only just continue to grow as time goes on. And then, how could I, how could I not, you know, end, end with, a, with a highlight here? Um, you know, Father Rossi, uh, I don't want to embarrass him too much, but I will a little bit. Uh, you know, one, I hope he beats Father Eichenlaub's uh, time here, but his tireless work and sacrifice, creativity, holiness, it not only helps bring us together, but it really inspires us to a greater love uh, and devotion to the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart. And again, that's why I think it's a fitting title that the speaker series is called uh, Hearts United. And my last, uh, I guess, thing here is gratitude. I thought I'd just share with you this, this uh, close us out with this little note. So after reviewing this extraordinary history, and I know I did it briefly and not, not completely. Uh, but after looking at it and the sacrifice demonstrated by bishops, abbots, pastors, priests, religious, parishioners, um, I thought I'd share with you a short note of gratitude that I wrote to a supporter of the Abbey. And I think it captures my gratitude to all those individuals who helped make it possible for us to be here today. And it begins like this. I've been thinking a lot about you lately, so I'm writing to see how you're doing. I hope you and your family are well. Although health fears, social unrest, economic collapse seem to dominate the news, and as concerned as I am about a return to normalcy, I find myself overwhelmed with gratitude for the infinite blessings that are raining down on us at every moment of every day. One of those many blessings for which I am most grateful is you. Your friendship and extraordinary support of our students and entire community reveal a deep and abiding love that I can only hope to emulate in my own life. The Abbey and St. Michael's, think of this, has survived two world wars, the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, and so much more. And I am confident that by the grace of God and our cooperation with it, we will overcome every challenge, including COVID-19. You, your family, and all of your good work will continue to be remembered each evening during our family rosary. I hope to see you soon. God bless Bill. Maybe I hope to don't see them too soon, um, if you get my point. Uh, I, I hope I will see them at some point. Um, but I thank God for each of you and for you being here this evening and for those that are viewing it. Um, I also want to thank my extraordinary 
good and holy and beautiful wife, Mary, uh, who is somewhere probably back there, over there, there she is, uh, and Jenny Ryan for all their sacrifice and work to make this possible. I know Jenny's been here, I think, since 7 o'clock this morning, so she's, she's not going to leave. She's going to stay here until tomorrow. Um, but I, their work has made this possible, and I hope that the talks from here will only get better. So please join me in thanking them and Father Rossi and everyone who helped make this evening a wonderful evening. So thank you all for being here, and uh, thanks for those watching and take care of yourselves, and God bless. Thank you, Dr. Theofelder. I'm, I'm reminded of the quote, we, um, we tend to preserve what we love, we love what we understand, and we understand what we are taught. So thank you for that wonderful history lesson, and um, hopefully it inspires all of us to preserve the and have gratitude with, um, of what we have here. And we'll teach our children what we have here and to continue to um, carry on. Um, thank you, um, Father Rossi and Michelle Volman, for this night. Thank, I wanted to thank Ken Albert for the technical support for tonight. Um, to <laughs> thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> There's a flyer, an event. The next event will be March 18th, and it is with um, Dr. Joseph Waisaki. He will be speaking on, a, on working out a picture of happiness, liberal education, and our children's souls. So don't miss that one. Um, save the dates are at the bottom. The next dates are April 8th and May 6th, and the topics will be forthcoming. Um, everyone's invited over to the parish hall for refreshments, um, and there's something for everyone, so no matter what you gave up in Lent, I'm sure there's something that you can find. Um, students that are here, don't forget to take your flyer with you, and you can have it signed by um, Mrs. Volman or Father Rossi or... Dr. Theofelder, that would be great. Um, thanks again for joining us.